Today we're continuing our series on what it means to have an unshakable faith in a world that is very, very shakable. And today specifically, we're talking about hope. We're going to be unpacking a passage of scripture in the book of Romans that I think is so powerful that I just want to dive right in and begin to experience God's word. And then throughout the message today, we're going to unpack this passage to see what it has to say for our lives. It's a treasure. Let me just begin reading in Romans chapter 8, picking up in verse 18. Here's what the scripture says. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. This is a cosmic passage of scripture in its scope, but it's so intimate in its practice. And my prayer today is that we will see God in his fullness and the message of hope that he has for us. Because the question that we're really asking today is, where do you place your hope? Where do you place your hope? I think that growing up in America, I was really conditioned to believe in neat and tidy endings. And let me tell you a story that reflects kind of how I, you know, expect the world to go. Earlier this week, Andrew and I were dead asleep. At least I was dead asleep. And at about two in the morning, she wakes me up with a startled look on her face. And I'm like, what's going on? If I had a baseball bat, I would grab it. Like, what is it? Is there an intruder? What's happening here? And she looks down at her hand and she said, Aaron, I can't believe it, but I just reached to feel my ring and my diamond is missing. I was like, what? Uh, like, hold on, let me wake up for a second. Which diamond? Because it has like, you know, a couple baguettes on the side. And she was like, the big one. And I'm like, what? The big one? Immediately, I was like flashing back to when I first bought that ring. Andrea and I had been dating for several years. It's a long story, but I was in love with her long before I realized I was in love with her. I had no idea how to be a good boyfriend, let alone a good husband. But through this process of God's grace and Andrea's patience, Man, I just realized it was time to ask the biggest question I would ever ask. Um, I remember ring shopping with my mom. We went to like the place where she always went in Buford, um, Georgia, which is where my dad's business is. She knew this guy, the owner of the store named Mr. Goovin, and the store was Goovin's. It's right across the street from the mall of Georgia. And it was just such a memorable moment of going in and picking out a ring. Uh, Years earlier, I had already kind of scoped out the kind of ring Andrea would want because by the time we actually started dating, I already knew I wanted to marry her. So when it came time to buy the ring, I knew just what to get. And it was so fun, like picking out the individual diamonds and looking at the clarity and learning about them and the time and thought it went into choosing that stone. So there we are in the middle of the night after years of marriage and the rock is missing and all in its place are these like glaring empty, like tongs that were holding the ring. One had broken off. And so we immediately do what you would expect. We went back to sleep. No, we started searching the whole house. We like, you know, like gently, like forensic scientists tore open the bed to see if it had gotten lost somewhere in the sheets. We're looking all around the edges. Then we started retracing Andrea's steps from earlier that day. I was asking her every place she had been. The problem is it was a cleaning day, so she'd been everywhere. So we're like retracing the steps, 2.30, 3 in the morning, 3.30. And finally she's like, oh, I remembered, I took out the trash. I'm like, great, today was the day you had to take out the trash. So of course, I'm like getting out this trash bag and I'm like, hey honey, did you throw away a potted plant? And she was like, yeah, one broke and so I threw it away. I'm like, great. So at like four in the morning, I'm like on my hands and knees, like gently sifting through this bag of trash. And I get all the way to the bottom, all the way to the corner of the bag where there's this pile of dirt. And I sift through the dirt and I found nothing. We didn't find it. We had to go to bed that night empty handed. And that was a few days ago. And this morning I got up and I looked and I still didn't find it. And I think that I'm not used to sermon illustrations that end that way. I'm used to people telling stories in moments like this where there's a neat and tidy ending. And it kind of communicates this message that if you're good, then life will be good. If you behave, then God will behave. 
And if you trust God and you pursue him, then in the end, you're going to get what you want. But losing that stone so far, I know some of you are like, all you're going to think about the rest of the message is like, well, have you tried this? Have you thought of this? Send all your, you know, suggestions our way. But I really began to like think of a bigger picture. Man, I so hope we find that stone. But it also reminded me that sometimes we place our value in the wrong things. Because as we were looking for that ring, as we were looking for the diamond, I realized like how much I was willing to do for Andrea. It wasn't just to find something that's like a value. It's because it was valuable to her, because it meant a lot to her. And the reason that meant a lot to me is because she means a lot to me. And so I was flooded all these memories of the symbol of our love. And I was so encouraged by the fact that even when the symbol fades, the love remains. And that's the idea of our message today. Today we are talking about hope. We love neat and tidy endings, but we live in a world that is not neat and tidy. What do we do next? How do we maintain hope in a world that is rarely neat and tidy? I love what the Bible says in Psalm 33, 22. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And I know that today we need more than just Christian talk. We need the words of life because so many of us are facing realities in a world that is constantly being shaken. Sickness like we've never seen, unprecedented turmoil in the world like we've never seen, unanswered questions like we've never had a face before. Some of us are facing the very real end of what our hope used to lean against. So let's take a pause and just define the word hope. What is hope? Hope is this, it's a person or thing in which my expectations are centered. Hope is a person or thing in which my expectations are centered. Another way to say it is this, the person or thing in which you have placed your confidence as it relates to the future. And that means that hopelessness is the feeling that comes with knowing that the person or thing in which I placed my hope in will not come through. And hopelessness is a feeling that way too many people are becoming more and more familiar with in these days. A simple way to picture it is this, hope is where you lean your ladder. Hope is where you lean your ladder. On your journey through life, what is your ladder leaned up against? Have you ever been on a tall ladder? Have you ever had someone holding it? Have you ever had a ladder that started to shake underneath you? Like being at the top of a tall ladder and suddenly feeling like the wall that you leaned it against isn't solid or the person that was holding on to you isn't strong enough, that is the feeling of hopelessness. It's the feeling of being shaken. And many of us this year have realized that, man, the thing I lean my ladder against, maybe it was my career or my relationship or my ability to achieve or my ability to win people over or the public opinion of me or the view I have of my future or my expectations or my ability to practice escapism or fun. Many of those things have been found to be shaken. What do we do in a world that's constantly being shaken? Where do you lean your ladder? That's the issue of hope. So now that we have a definition of hope, let's talk a little bit about the history of hope. We all have hope. The truth is we all place our hope somewhere. And from the day we are born, neurologists teach us that our hope is hardwired, usually to our parents. Like we're relying upon our parents for everything. It's amazing to see my daughter Rosalie at one year old. You know, we've had a wild year of shifting around and staying with my parents for a season. And I feel like my daughter Rosalie is in a different room every other night just because of how her little young life has gone. And because of that, she's formed this deep attachment to Andrea. Like she loves everybody, but there is this sense of relief and relaxation on Rosalie's face when Andrea's in the room. And it's so true, like we're hardwired to look to our parents to meet our needs. But at some point that hope shifts when we realize that our parents don't have every single thing that we need. And I have a daughter named Valentine who's seven and she's starting to realize that the world is big and her needs are bigger than just her mom and me. And it's so painful as parents, but at the same time, we want her to find a new place to lean her ladder, something that is solid and strong and true. Um, we trust people 
We trust security. We trust future to meet our hopes and dreams. And yet all of those things can be shaken. And so we have to be so careful in our lives of not establishing a false hope. And I think the truth of the matter is the older we get, the more prone we are to lean our ladders against people and things that promise financial and emotional security. In fact, we really begin to build our lives around the things that promise financial and emotional security. And in a world like this, in a day like today, many of us are experiencing a shattered hope. In fact, I was reading a tragic statistic. It says the leading cause of suicide is an overwhelming sense of hopelessness, generally related back to relational or financial insecurity. It gives me so much compassion to read this verse again. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And so as we read this, we have some really big questions. The first one is, how do we establish hope in a world that is constantly shaken? Throughout the Bible, we are told to put our hope in God, that the only way to maintain hope in a broken world is to place our hope in God. But that's just so easy to say. What does it look like to wrestle with those ideas? I think that maybe God isn't the go-to in our culture because in our nation, we aren't fully convinced that our world is broken. We think there's a stimulus package that can come along and save the day. We think that there is a new innovation in technology that can help everything. We believe that we can save ourselves through exercise, through the right medicines, through surgery, through education. We think that we can achieve to a place where we are untouchable. And we lean our ladders there. And so the reason that we are slow to look to God is because we aren't fully convinced that our world is broken. However, we're faced with constant reminders that our world is broken, and it's more broken than we know. I want to look back to our passage today in Romans chapter 8, where the author, the Apostle Paul, is writing almost a treatise on what real Christianity is. It's not about doing good things to please a distant deity to get the things we want. It's about living a new surrendered life to an overcoming hope. And this is not something Paul just thought about. It's something that he himself lived. Paul wrote the book of Romans from a city called Corinth where he planted a notoriously sinful church, but it's a church that he loved and he ministered to constantly. And he wrote this letter to Christians in the city of Rome, which was a city he couldn't wait to get to. And the great irony is that Paul would eventually make it to Rome, but he would do it in chains as a prisoner of the state. And it was right outside the gates of Rome where he would be executed. And yet we see that Paul had an unwavering trust in God. Why? Where did he establish this sense of love? And where did he find an unshakable sense of well-being? Because church history tells us that he had joy to the end and his life would cause a ripple effect around the world reaching into this room today. Well, let's just read some of the beliefs that Paul had. Here's what he thought about God for himself. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 21, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory to the children of God. There's some huge ideas here. I just want to call out one thing. Like what the Bible is saying is God wants us to be set free from our current bondage to decay. The Bible is essentially saying like you are handcuffed right now. And if you looked over to the thing that you're handcuffed to, it's to a decaying dead cow. And it's just rotting beside us. And it stinks and it's smelly and there's flies flying all around. And you can do anything in the world to forget that the cow is there or to pretend the cow is not there or to get better and better like fragrances to hide the fact that like what we're chained to is decay but the truth of the matter is we don't need better ways to hide decay we need better ways to be freed from decay and paul is saying that that is the whole goal of our faith 
The world offers escapism. The world offers ways to forget. The world offers ways to try to self-liberate, but none of them work in the end. What God is offering is the ultimate freedom from our bondage to decay. So where did this decay come from? Well, that is answered in the scripture as well. It says that the whole world is subjected to frustration. Have you ever looked around at the world and you're like, man, the more I learn about the world, the more frustrated I get. The more I read the news, <laughs> the more I talk to people about how bad things are, the more frustrating it is. Well, the truth of the matter is you're not seeing things. The world is really frustrating. Have you ever just stopped and think, man, what kind of government would we need to fix everything? And there's like, like no end to that conversation. Have you ever just thought about some of the world's problems like poverty or sickness or homelessness and thought about what, like how can we like legislate this change? I hope that we ask those questions. I think we should be asking those questions, but there's a piece of us that needs to know that it's always gonna be frustrating. And that's because the world is subjected to frustration. Why is that? Well, great question. Because I think the way you view hope is closely linked to the way that you view sin. I think the way that you view hope is closely linked to the way that you view sin. Most of us like to think of sin as an isolated action. We like to call it out in others because we found it. We found the sin. It's over there. It's not in us. We like to view sin as an isolated act, but God views sin as a fatal disease. And once it was introduced into the world, it was going to kill everything. Have you ever noticed that everything with life dies? Everything with life eventually dies. Verse 20, the creation was subjected to frustration. And the translation of this original Greek is really interesting. It essentially means this. It, it means that God has allowed for sin and decay to run its course in the world. Why would God do that, you ask? Well, because we demanded it. We demanded it. Sin really means me without God. Me without God. I mean, back to the original sin. I mean, Adam and Eve, essentially what they thought is like, we want to be like God without God. That was the original temptation. My son, John Charles, is three years old, and he has the same disease as every three-year-old in the whole world. That knowledge that I can do it my way. Now, my son is a hungry boy. He's always hungry. He was born hungry and he's never ever slowed down and the boy loves a juice box. And I can remember one day uh, he was like asking me, dad, can I have a juice? Dad, can I have a juice? And finally I was like, sure. And so I get out the juice and I'm ready to bless my son to quench his thirst with this wonderful little apple juice box. And I start to pull the wrapper off and he's like, you know, pull the straw and he's like, no dad, I can do it. And I'm like, son, come on, let me help you. Like, I know it doesn't look complicated, but there's a little system here. He's like, no, dad, I can do it all by myself. And so finally he like snatches it out of my hand. And I have the choice in that moment. I can snatch it back from him, or I can realize that life is a powerful teacher and I can let him run his course. And so I'm hoping for the best, but at the same time, I'm a friend of reality. <laughs> and so he takes it out and he like struggles and he finally gets the paper off the straw and he starts to like jam it in the top of the straw, but he like breaks it in half. And so now there's a split in the straw. So even when he starts to drink it, it's not gonna be good. And finally, finally, um, because he's like so intense, he's squeezing the juice box so hard, like trying to get a good grip on it. Finally, he's able to like poke it through the little tin foil. And of course he gets like this waterfall of apple juice all over him. And he's looking at me stunned, like, I'm still thirsty, I got a broken straw, and now I have a huge mess. And the truth of the matter is, when we do it our way, we look the same as my son. We're standing there still thirsty. Our thirst has not been quenched. And we have broken things in our hands. And we're like standing in this huge mess of our own making. And that's what it looks like to live in a world where sin has run its course. But we don't just have like a juice box, we have a tidal wave of consequence. And it's not just for our sin. I mean, the truth, the sad truth of the world is, is my son's mess wasn't just his mess, it was my mess, it was everybody's mess, it was everybody in the splash zone's mess. We're all living in the world's splash zone where sin is running its course and it's not a pretty picture. I'm not saying that like 
every bad thing in your life is a direct response to something you've done. No, the truth of the matter is, is we all impact each other. All of our sin's consequence impact each other, and it's led us to live in a world filled with decay. And God looks on this world with compassion, and he says his ultimate goal for our lives is to be liberated from this. We want neat and tidy lives. But the world just won't cooperate, will it? Things break, people misbehave, and no matter how clever we are, we cannot overcome or outrun the world's decay. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, that's the picture Paul begins to paint. And here's the summary. Accept reality, mourn the loss, and look for something better. That leads us to our big question of the day. Where are you leaning your ladder? I know a lot of people that think, man, I was leaning on this career, but the problem was I picked the wrong career. I'm just gonna try a new one. Some people who are like, I'm leaning on my own abilities, my, my willpower, and so I just need to try harder. Some people are saying, I, I was leaning on this relationship. The problem is I picked the wrong person. I'm gonna pick a new person. And yet we find again and again, the problems follow us. God offers a better hope. Look what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Paul writes, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Some of us are like, 2021 was bad. I'm like, yeah, so was 2020 in lots of ways. I don't know if you know about what's happening in the world. A lot of bad things happen. And can I tell you, a lot of bad things were happening in 2019. Genocide and heartache and exploitation and injustice. And you know what? A lot of bad things were happening in the 1950s. There was a lot of atrocities happening in the world in the 1950s. Like whatever you think the golden age was, bad things were happening. The 1500s, the 1100s, the 900s, the zeros, the BCs. Like the world has been groaning. Ever since sin came into the picture, we are not unique in this hardship. We're just unique in the fact that it's happening to us. And that always feels more personal. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. What Paul is saying is here is even those who believe in Jesus and have the Holy Spirit, we groan inwardly because now we've had a taste of a kingdom that's better than the one we're living in. And we're groaning for the day when everything will be put right. And that's a good thing, Paul says. Look, verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And I don't know that every Christian has read those verses because a lot of Christians say this, God is good, so if God is in my life, then life will get good. God will be the thing that makes me forget the dead cow rotting beside me. God will be the thing that makes my finances go the way I want them to. God will be the power for me to finally achieve my agenda. And yet Paul is saying right here, there will be a sense of this groaning for the rest of our lives on this earth. The very hope that saves us is the very hope that reminds us you don't hope for things you don't have yet. You hope in anticipation for the life to come. Hope is powerful. But I'm telling you, sometimes the days are weary. I hope that one day I'm gonna be reunited with my Savior and be made whole and all the problems will be washed away. I hope for that day, but sometimes the days clobber me. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, what am I supposed to hold on to when I can't even hold anything anymore? How do I keep from slipping? How do I hold on to this faith in God? And that's where Paul gets really honest. That's where Paul paints the picture of God's role in this journey. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. When you don't know how to pray, the Bible says God prays for you. And it's this moment, it's moments like this, it's moments of hardships where we have to decide what the real gift is, the presence or the presence. Now that sounds the same, so let me explain. When I was young growing up, I used to have some great birthday parties and I was always so pumped for the presents my friends would bring. Like, ooh, is that a big one? Is it a small one? Did they bring a Ninja Turtle? I hope they know I don't like Power Rangers. That's too little for me. That's what my brother likes. Please bring another Michelangelo Ninja Turtle. I'm so excited. But as I look back on those birthday parties, I can't remember anything, any of the gifts my friends brought, but I do remember the presence of my friends being with me that they were present and active with me, that they were the ones that met me at the roller skating rink and we skated around, that they were the ones that came to the pool party where we played king of the float. I don't remember the gifts, but I remember their presence. And I think when it comes to God, we've got to decide, do we want what he can give or do we want him? The truth of Christianity is that the promise of God is the presence of God. The promise of God is the presence of God. What the Bible teaches is that on your darkest days, the love of God can still wrap you up like a hug and remind you that while the world may fail, you will never be left alone, that you will never ever be forgotten. And when you don't know how to pray, he will show you how to pray. And when you still can't pray, he will pray for you. And the reason I'm still walking in faith is because I've reached those moments of crisis when I didn't know where to turn when things weren't working out, where I didn't know how to take my next step, but I still felt wrapped up in the love of God. Where are you leaning your ladder when all else fails? Are you managing your own hopeless situation or are you willing to let go of broken things and let go of broken situations and say, God, I trust you even when I can't see you? What's the belief? It's this, that God is present in our pain. God is present in our pain. But the scripture goes on to paint an even more beautiful picture, that because of God's work, there is purpose in our pain. God is present in our pain and there is purpose in our pain. Let me read you Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Man, that's so good. That's so good, but sometimes I misapply it. Sometimes I read this and I think it means for the here and now. I love watching this funny YouTube series. I think it's called Screen Rant and it's called Pitch Meeting. And what the guy does is he goes through like all these famous movies and he sort of pokes fun at how convenient every major Hollywood plot works out. There's always this moment when he's uh, like, kind of giving out the plot and the person hearing it is like, oh my gosh, you've built so much tension. This must be really, really hard to resolve. And the guy has this line where he's like, no, it's super easy, barely an inconvenience. And he goes on to say like how Hollywood plots are always easily fixed by some easy plot device that resolves the tension and brings about neat and tidy endings. I think all of us are trying to live that Hollywood story to find that simple plot device which turns everything on its head and maybe our lives will be super easy and barely inconvenient. And maybe that's what God's goodness looks like. Can I tell you, that is not the story of the scripture. Because in our story, in that Hollywood ending, we want to be the authors. And if that means we're the authors, that means God is nothing more than a convenient plot device. And we have this halfway trust in God. God, I trust you as long as you're doing things my way. And here's the big problem. That looks a lot like Christianity, but in truth, it's a lot closer to blasphemy because in that scenario, he's the helper and we're the king. God's story for us has a happy ending. We just don't get to set the timeline. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? Right, in a message like today, 
where it talks about the world is groaning, but God has purpose in your pain. You can set your hope, but your hope, the very hope that saves you is something you hold on to for years until that final day when God redeems everything to himself and his kingdom. And even when you don't have the strength to hold on, he's holding on to you. And even when you don't know how to pray, he is praying for you and through you. And you're like, that's all great. But what shall we say in response to these things? Here's what we say. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? That's your destiny. That's your destiny. All things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. We want God to give us the power of avoidance. But God has given us something else, the power of resurrection. And because of Jesus, you're invited to lean your ladder or to place your hope in the unshakable love of God. And here's what God says about those who do that. In verse 37, knowing all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Precious person, in these days, more than ever, we are learning where our hope is leaning. Either we move it to something stable or we will lose it. What or whom you are hoping in determines your ability to maintain hope in a broken world. And we have been invited to lean our hope against God's unending love for us. Psalm 33, 22. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I'm praying for you. I care about you. And I love you, but nothing in comparison to how God loves you. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, let today be the day. Reach out to us so we can walk you through this decision. But precious believer, I want you to look at your life and ask, where are you leaning your ladder? Today you're invited to fall again into the unshakable arms of Christ. In Him we place our hope. Mm -hmm.